everyone to this very special event of I-24 News and the American Zionist Movement. The American Zionist Movement consists of 33 American Jewish Zionist organizations from across the spectrum of American Jewish life. Very diverse organizations. Organizations from all the religious streams. Organizations that provide health care, that provide special needs for children who are at risk, that are involved in global issues and global advocacy. The work of the American Zionist movement in moving Zionism forward is designed to expose, to educate, to inform and to involve the entire American Jewish community in the great spirit and support of our beloved state of Israel and the history and the future of the Jewish people. Today, we bring together six selected AZM organizations in order to present to you a great sense of how they do their work, how they have passion for their mission, and how they deliver for Israel and for the Jewish people. On behalf of Dr. Francine Stein, the chair of the AZM National Board and our, and our AZM Leadership Cabinet and the entire board and all 33 organizations, uh, we welcome you today. We had the opportunity to work with I-24 News on three events called a celebration of democracy during the recent three elections held in Israel and they were live broadcast back to various AZM locations in the United States. I-24 News is a powerful organization working in coordination with the American Zionist movement to see to it that message is delivered, to see to it that information is open, and to see to it that the diversity of the American Jewish community and the American Zionist community is spotlighted. Please welcome Frank Malul, the CEO and founder of I-24 News. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Hi, everybody. I would like first to uh, welcome you here in, uh, in Tel Aviv, the opportunity for you to, to see the newsroom uh, of I-24 News. Uh, I'm in the middle of the newsroom, and I'm talking, uh, I'm talking to you in the, inside the Arabic studio. But I'm not alone today. Uh, I'm uh, with uh, two amazing hosts for I-24 News, Natasha Kirchuk, who uh, is hosting uh, the primetime show Global Eye, and Kalev Ben David, who is hosting the news primetime show The Rundown. My name is Franck Meloul. I'm the CEO and the founder of I-24 News. And it's the opportunity for me today uh, to uh, show you and to explain you what is behind I-24 News and uh, the DNA of the channel. But first, I would like to say that it's something very original that we are launching today. And I'm very excited, Richard, to start uh, this original thing with a partnership with the American Zionist uh, movement. So I would like first to give you a test of I-24 News and to show you a small clip. I-24 News, the Altice Group International News TV Network, is an amazing project, unbiased international news coverage through the prism of the Middle East from the Middle East. Today, more than one billion households worldwide have access to I-24 News. Quand on vient faire son métier de journaliste ici au cœur du Moyen-Orient, c'est pas pour faire de la figuration, on évolue dans une région sensible où chaque mot compte. In just a few years, I-24 News has become a global news network. Bonsoir. Hello and welcome to Israel Business Weekly. Today, I-24 News employs 150 journalists from 35 different countries, from our offices in Tel Aviv, Paris, New York, Washington, and Los Angeles. Our team delivers the news to our audience in three languages. French, English, and Arabic. Pour moi, c'est très important de conserver notre diversité culturelle. I've always thought that this region in particular is often misunderstood 
And it's our job as journalists to fix that. مما لا شك فيه فإن هذا هو أفضل مكان لتحليل ولفهم الأخبار الدولية. Things are happening here. When you look at the major news stories, you realize that almost everything starts from here. I-20 for News is not only a non-stop news network. It also broadcasts daily shows and magazines to analyze and help our viewers understand the news with guests from all backgrounds for open and unfiltered discussions. الإصغاء لكل المواقف والاعتبارات يمكننا من تغليب حرية التعبير على أي اعتبار آخر. Rendre compte des événements avec précision sans tenir au fait rien d'autre, c'est ça qui fait la différence. I24 News is available everywhere on TV, web, apps, social media, and OTT. We are working 24-7 to provide our audience with the most reliable information as fast as possible. I'm Israeli, I'm Palestinian, I'm Arab, I'm Christian, I'm a woman, I'm a journalist. That's what makes I-24 News so special. I-24 News, see beyond. So this is I-24 News, this is the way we build I-24 News, just for the background. Uh, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a businessman. I just became uh, an entrepreneur. I'm a former French diplomat. And you can imagine, as a diplomat, it's uh, very interesting when we are thinking and talking about soft power. And exactly eight years ago, I uh, got a call. I was uh, working uh, at France 24 because the French president, Jacques Chirac, appointed me to launch France 24. And I got a call from a guy I never heard before. It was Patrick Drahi. And Patrick Drahi was, and still is, a tycoon and owner of many cable networks in the world. And he told me, Frank, I want to have a coffee with you. And I said, OK, let's go for a coffee. I thought he wanted to speak about France 24 and the distribution of France 24 uh, in his own cable networks. And he told me this sentence, son, you have to stop now and to start to do something for your country. So I was laughing. I said, this guy is joking. I'm working for the French government since 10 years. This is the reason he's a billionaire and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not rich. And uh, he's asking me now to do something for my country. And he said, I'm not talking about France. I'm talking about Israel. It was in October 2012. And I asked him, why you want to do something for Israel, or you want me to do something for Israel? And he told me, you know, as the owner of many cable network, I'm asking my, uh, my companies, when we are talking about the Middle East, what are the channels that the people are the most watching? The answer was at 97%, Al Jazeera. And I'm fed up when I'm traveling all over the world to see that when I'm in Israel, I don't feel the same reality that I'm watching on the international network. So I saw what you built for France 24. I want you to come to Israel with me. I want you to build something huge there and to do exactly the same. And if you are not coming, I will not build it. It was in October 2012. I resigned from the French government in November 2012. And I did my Aliyah with all my family in December 2012. And I arrived here in Israel with a blank paper, with a big project a crazy project, but with nothing. So this is the reason I said we need uh, to build like I did in France 24. And we decided in Jaffa, in this hangar, to build from scratch in 100 days a French channel, an English channel, and an Arabic channel. We started with 150 employees. Today we are 300 employees here in Tel Aviv. We have teams and studios all over the world, especially in Paris, New York, Washington, and Los Angeles. But where you can watch I-24 News? Today, we are broadcasting in one billion homes. Maybe you will see a slide here. So you can see that uh, we are very strong in Europe. We are very strong in the Middle East. We are in Asia. And we are in America since two years. So you can watch I-24 News 
in Infinity, Comcast, on Spectrum, Optimum, Mediacom, DirecTV, Suddenlink, and Fios. So we are almost in the main cable networks in America. In Europe, we are in France, Italy, Spain, Poland, Portugal, Benelux, and Switzerland. And in the Middle East, we are on the main Arabic network with the Arabic channel of I24 News. And of course, we are broadcasting in Israel on HOT, the cable company. But what is very interesting with the French network since the last few months, we start to become very, 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 very famous in Africa. In North of America, you know all these uh, networks, of course, so I'm pretty sure uh, today you will connect maybe for the first time or for the second, the third, or like every day on your cable network. And also, we are on the OTT platform with Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire, and all the tablet and the mobile phone. So now let's talk about our content. Let's touch more the content with this short clip. Uh, and I've said time and time again that I would not remove a single Israeli settlement, settlement or single Israeli Forcibly. It's all about Israel. Left, right, doesn't matter. That means we could be looking at a third election. We could be. I hope not. It's up to the voters. We're inside the tunnel right now. That is the tunnel that crosses from the Lebanese side into the Israeli side. Well, a cameraman actually zoom in to the, to the wreckage here uh, behind us. You guys, this is, it's really, if you look at aerial images, it doesn't look like there's even anything left. This, what I'm holding here, Jeff, is a part of the roof. What kind of feedback have you received from viewers so far? So far, you know, in Israel, it, the reactions are pretty enthusiastic, are pretty positive. It's not part, it's not part of a peace treaty. It's a unilateral move that actually because declared... Because the Palestinians aren't coming to the table. They're, not, they're literally they're not answering the president's no, they, call. they are ready to come to the table. The Israeli bulldozers are trying to snatch, pick up a corpse from the ground, going all over the world. That is a, a good tactic to use in this case. Uh, if the alternative is to send in a soldier that will be killed by a Hamas sniper, I prefer a bad image. Do you think that this bailout is really going to be enough to keep El Al afloat in the long term? Uh, hi, Natasha. Uh, I think that um, El Al has a good chance of keeping afloat. I thought we have to take ourselves out of Lebanon. Uh, I'm not just uh, happy with it, I'm proud of it. I have led the fight to stand with Israel, to strengthen our relationship, to increase our support for Israel, and to stand up to Iran and our enemy. It's always great to be here at APAC and, and to see the very essence of citizen participation in our democracy. Do you understand the plan? What is the meaning of undivided Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and Eastern Jerusalem as the capital of a Palestinian state? I think if annexation is implemented, that means they want to destroy the Palestinian Authority. And then Netanyahu can assume his full powers as an occupying power. I have to tell you that I think, you know, this is one of these moments that I, I sure hope that we don't look back in a year or two and say, like, you know, that's not what we imagined that would happen. So now the question that we can ask, is it working or is it not working? After seven years, in uh, July we will celebrate our seventh anniversary. The question is, as a diplomat, always to ask myself, there is an impact or there is not an impact. What is behind I-24? The, the, the idea behind I-24 is to change the perception of Israel in the world. The idea behind I-24 is to connect Israel to the world, but also to connect the world to Israel. And I want to know if the leaders in the world start to be connected to I-24 news. And I'm very happy to, to show you something right now that uh, we have already been retweeted twice by Donald Trump. Not only by Donald Trump, but also by Jawad Zarif, who is the Minister of Iranian Affairs, or Foreign Affairs in Iranian. And we have also Benjamin Netanyahu. You saw that uh, Saeb Rakat and many Palestinian leaders are also using I-24 News as a platform. Now let's talk about viewership. When we are asking people, 
What do you think about I-24? They are saying it's the alternative of Al Jazeera. But I'm telling you, I don't want to become the alternative of Al Jazeera. I want to become the alternative of BBC World. Because the storytelling about BBC World, about the Middle East, is not the right one. And I'm happy to show you that according to our cable network in, uh, in America, I-24 News is already doing better ratings than BBC World News or Euro News. Why? Because we are more authentic. And people who used to watch BBC are watching now I-24 News. Of course, you have a lot of Jewish people. Of course, you have a lot of evangelicals watching I-24 News. But look what's going on here. A lot of Muslims left BBC to watch I-24 News because they are feeling it's more authentic and it's talking from the heart of the Middle East. This is the second challenge after influence to have viewership. The third challenge is to be credible. And to be credible, you have to be credible in terms of content and in terms of business. So if you feel like a channel of philanthropy, people will say it's propaganda. But we are a business news channel. This is the reason I'm very proud to show you that already big brands in the world are trusting the content of I-24 News. So of course, I'm pretty sure you have a lot of questions. I'm here with my colleagues to answer your question. But there is also many organizations involved with AZM. We will now like to learn more about them. And we have chosen six organizations to put a spotlight on. And let's begin with the Bnei Brief International. Thank you very much, Frank, and thank you, Richard. Uh, that was a video about our activity at the United Nations in 1945. B'nai B'rith was invited, just one of a few Jewish organizations, to the founding of the UN. And then in 1947, we received our NGO credentials uh, at the UN in New York. And in 1960, I actually opened the first full-time office on United Nations affairs in the Jewish community. And today, we're in Paris at UNESCO and in Geneva at the Human Rights Council and in other places where the UN as agencies. Okay. Our primary work at the UN is engaged in pro-Israel advocacy. Now, B'nai B'rith itself was founded in 1843. We're the oldest of the Jewish organizations. We were founded uh, by 12 German Jewish immigrants on the Lower East Side of New York who were helping an indigent widow who had had some, some problems. We became a membership organization that grew as immigration to the United States uh, grew apace. We established ourselves overseas in the latter half of the 19th century. Uh, in fact, our first branch in pre-state Palestine was founded in 1888 in Jerusalem, and the first mazkir, the first secretary of that group, was none other than Eliezer ben Yehuda. And uh, before Hitler came to power in 1933, there were over 100 branches of B'nai B'rith in Germany alone. Today, we have three programmatic priorities. The first is public policy, including fighting anti-Semitism and pro-Israel advocacy. We've opened an office in Brussels at the European Union. We think that's important. We have uh, an office, several offices, actually, in, in Latin America, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, we are deeply involved in fighting anti-Semitism globally as that phenomenon has spiked exponentially. 
were involved in senior housing and senior advocacy. Jews actually have fewer children and live longer, so the proportion of seniors in the Jewish community worldwide is quite large. We are the largest sponsor of affordable housing for seniors uh, in the United States, 38 properties, 7,000 apartments, 5,000 residents. Uh, we uh, are deeply involved also in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, uh, raising funds uh, for the victims of hurricanes and tsunamis, tornadoes, most recently involved in okay. raising funds to provide important uh, uh, face masks and other equipment during the coronavirus crisis. So that's our organization. We're worldwide. We're based in several dozen countries. Uh, we're an organization that is committed uh, to helping uh, to advocate for the state of Israel, particularly in these difficult times and in fighting anti-Semitism. Thank you, Dan, for participating to this uh, event today. And now I'm very happy to introduce Rhoda Smoloff, national president of ADASA, the Women's Zionist Organization of America. At Hadassah, healing is at the heart of our mission, and Israel is in our DNA. Our founder, Henrietta Zold, brought healing and medicine to pre-state Israel, paving the way for Israel's modern healthcare system. We proudly advance her legacy of healing the world. We heal the world through our internationally renowned Hadassah Medical Organization, which treats one million patients a year, regardless of race, religion, or nationality, and is recognized for its humanitarian efforts around the world. We heal the world by empowering women to make a difference. We raise our voices to affect change for critical issues, including the Never Again Education Act. Our youth villages in Israel provide education and support for at-risk young adults. And we are proud to fund scholarships for thousands of youths to attend Young Judea summer camps and Israel programs. For over a century, Hadassah has stood for healing our world. Today, our passion and determination are stronger than ever. We need to be heard and we need not to be afraid. We need your voices to be loud. Thank you, Frank. Hadassah was founded over a century ago before Israel was a state and before women could vote. But since that time, the organization has remained unwavering in its commitment to women's health and well being and to Israel and Jewish values and continuity. But Hadassah's heritage and mission remain strong as ever. The role of women and Jewish culture here and in Israel has evolved over time. And so has the organization, taking on new challenges and developing new programs. Hadassah believes in building a world where Jewish values and action create strong community and enduring Israel. Hadassah is very proud of our hospitals in Jerusalem, and we have spent over 100 years supporting the hospital and creating new centers of excellence. Right now, since the population of Jerusalem has tripled since 1960, we are creating a 360 degrees full circle campaign we are renovating the iconic round building and we'll be moving on to other centers of excellence within the campus. And we're very excited about that. In America, we believe that we stand as great advocates because Hadassah's 300,000 women are, can be found in all 50 states in the United States. And in fact, we have just helped over the last two years create a bill, the Never Again Education Act, which on May 28th was signed into law at the White House. We are very excited that every single school district, every single board of education can now apply for a grant to include Holocaust education in their curriculum for high school students. And in fact, our members are prepared to go out in the country and to fight to see that this exists. Because while it sounds like Holocaust education, Holocaust education is an education against hate and injustice for all. And that is our impact and what Hadassah does in the United States. We are passionate about advocating for women's health issues as well as all sorts of injustice. So I am very proud to be the 27th president of Hadassah and proud to be here today. Thank you. All right.
questions. So as the woman in the room here, I'm going to take, uh, I have a question <laughs> for you. I'm a huge fan of, of what your organization does, Rhoda. And, you know, the coronavirus pandemic has impacted the world in so many different ways right now, but women are certainly being disproportionately affected. How has your organization's work changed uh, with the onset of this pandemic? Thank you for asking that. Um, Hadassah has recognized uh, very strongly that we need to be very supportive to the women who are the heads of the families and also career women and such. We have created um, Zoom webinars for people from all over this country and in Israel with doctors, psychologists, social workers to really help them be able to deal with the stress, to be able to continue doing what they're doing. We also have had um, physicians on Zoom webinars to talk about not ignoring women's health during this pandemic. Um, it has become, we have become very aware that women have neglected going to the hospital. They're afraid to go if they're having such examples of symptoms of coronary disease and therefore taking chances on dying. So we have really encouraged through our work at the hospital um, in Israel and in, in the United States for women to be more proactive about their own health and the health of their, and the health of their families. All right, Rhoda, well, thank you so much for that response. Gives us some insight into what you're doing. And if, do you, if you have any questions for us, we're also happy to answer them as well. Who? One of the things that we are the most proud about is that our hospital was, as I'm sure you know, nominated for the Nobel Prize. Because in, when you walk into Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem, you see Arab Jews and Christians all races and religions working side by side, as well as patients being cared for from every single race and religion. I would like to know how I-24 can get that message out about what we stand for and what we believe in. Well, I think that, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about my show, Global Eye. Our team is made up completely of women, so we are a all uh, women power team. And one of the the, you know, the issues that we like covering the most is women's rights issues because it just, you know, obviously appeals to us as, as the women who are behind the show putting the lineup together, but also because we understand how very important it is to highlight the way that women are often disproportionately impacted by major world issues like the coronavirus, as you just said. So to give you a sense of some of the topics that we've covered on our show, uh, which I think very much align with the issues that your organization deals with on a daily basis, I mean... It could be everything from, you know, the issue of beauty standards in the Middle East and Asia, women who are using products to lighten their skin because that is what is considered beautiful and the negative impact that can have on health, um, to then talking about the rape crisis in Nigeria where one in four women are uh, sexually assaulted. That's a statistic that nobody is really working on changing that in Nigeria. So we try to highlight issues abroad um, that are related to women and then also look at what's happening here on the ground in Israel, why has there been a you know a rise in domestic abuse cases amidst the coronavirus pandemic, and what is the government trying to do to fix that? We try to bring women and organizations combating these issues into our studio to interview them. So I'm sure that down the line we could certainly interview uh, people from your organization about these issues. So I, I'd like to suggest that also at the hospital we have a special um, Linda Joy Poland Cardiovascular Wellness Center. And it's really about treating women in cardiovascular disease. But our top doctor there, Donna Zvatsvas, um, goes out into um, impoverished neighborhoods, but also religious neighborhoods, Arabic neighborhoods, to talk to women about taking care of themselves and their right. hearts. So that would be something that would be a, a right on topic for you to uh, go in and interview and see what we are doing. I think I'd like to love that. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you Rhoda. Rhoda. Thank you for being with us today. For sure, we have a lot of things to do uh, with Adasa and uh, as the CEO of I24 News. You have my team, and if you have many ideas and many projects that, and messages that you want to deliver, the channel is open for you. And now I, I suggest to you to move to the Rabbi Josh Weinberg, who is the executive director of Artsa. Yeah, Shalom. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Frank. It's a pleasure to be with you. As ARTS, as the Association of Reform Zionists in America, we believe uh, that it's our mission to educate and mobilize Reform Jews in North America in order to build enduring connections to Israel and Reform Zionist commitments in order to 
shape and mobilize the scale as the largest movement, the largest Jewish religious movement in North America in order to advocate for Israel, for her security, and to see Israel as a Jewish, democratic, and pluralistic state with, of course, a vibrant, reformed Jewish community. Artsu was founded about 43 years ago uh, as the relationship with Israel and the reform movement was evolving to build more and more connections, greater support, and to deepening the Jewish identity of our, uh, of our community in North America. Since we've been doing that, we've been supporting our Israel movement for reform and progressive Judaism so much that it's doubled in its congregations in Israel, now 52 congregations, and a leading legal and advocacy wing called the Israel Religious Action Center, which represents us, and not just us, but all of Israeli society in both the courts and in the Knesset. I'm very proud of the fact that over 13% of Israelis now identify with the liberal streams with reform and conservative Judaism as we're now making inroads, changing what it means to be Jewish in the Jewish state. That is an exciting moment, and we're looking forward to continuing to bring Israel to our reform movement here in America and help to grow and expand our reform movement uh, on the ground in Israel. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say personally uh, hello to Richard, to Josh, to to, uh, to Dan and all of the people, and I'm sure so many of the other people that I've known over the years, and some that I've uh, hosted on my program, including Josh, uh, and he will tell you we have spoken about issues of religion and state. But not just because reform, of course, is known for its social advocacy, and we have also discussed some of those issues. So let me ask you, Jess, we've covered some of those. What more would you like to see us here on I-24 News that uh, cover that, for example, uh, either reform congregations or you as a movement or even individuals have been active in? Have been active in? Well, thank you, Kalev, and it's a wonderful question. It's nice to see you and nice to be with you again as well. And we you know, have so much in common and, 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 and shared experiences. I, I think that I-24 does a wonderful job in its coverage, and I would suggest that, that there is an undercurrent of a, real, a revolution in Jewish life in Israel. <clears throat> there was a real renaissance of growing where people are coming out of the woodwork to explore Jewish identity, and they're doing that, uh, I think, with our movement, among others. And that's, that's an exciting moment. I think that Israelis are, are waking up to two specific realities. One, where... Having a Jewish state doesn't necessarily mean having a Jewish community. And two, where the polarizing dichotomy between religious or secular really no longer answers the needs of the mainstream. So that's, that's, a, that's Zionism in the 21st century in my mind. And, and I, I wonder how we can put a spotlight on these incredible stories that are really changing the face of Israeli society day in and day out. Right. And I do want to point out, uh, like you said, uh, you know we cover those on my own program, The Rundown, because you've been a guest on that program and many of your colleagues have been. Uh, but they are covered in many other aspects on Natasha's show, for example, or we have a show called Holy Land Uncovered, whose focus actually is uh, uh, religion and archaeology, and we've had many reform rabbis. And, uh, you know, I have to say something. Those people who are familiar with Israeli media know that reform, the reform and conservative movements are often a, kind of put in a niche, a niche that when they have reform and conservative rabbis on, it's usually only to talk about reform and conservative movements. And I think one of the things, positive things we've been able to do is if we're discussing a broader Jewish subject, even if it's just something, the meaning of a particular holiday, we will go and reform and conservative, along with orthodox, will be included as part of a normative thing. And I think that is something unique that we do, and uh, of course, internationally, but especially if here, here in Israel. Well, well, thank you for that. And as our movement continues to grow, we look forward to more uh, relationships and greater partnership. And we look forward to Josh. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. You, you always welcome on I-24 News. And I would like to invite to talk Sarah Crane, Executive Director of Merkaz. So Merkaz, in many ways, is very similar to Artsa, that we are the Zionist arm of the conservative movement. The conservative movement was always Zionist from the moment it was founded. And we always had projects in Israel going back many, many, many years. And what we work on now is really strengthening the ties between American Jews in Israel and between Israeli Jews and American Jews. 
We like the reform movement. We know that being secular or being orthodox no longer works for Israelis. And one of the things that developed in the diaspora was what we consider to be a different approach to Judaism. We are a halachic movement, and yet we look at things differently. We now have more than 80 kihilot, 80 congregations spread across Israel. We have a congregation. We exist in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, but also in Malaya Dumim and in the Negev, in Omer, in Ashkelon, in lots of places. And we're also finding that currently more than 50% of those who are affiliated with Masorti, with the conservative Kihilot in Israel, are not from the Americas, that we're no longer a group that is importing something, but we're a place where Israelis, people living in Israel, feel at home, and we give them a way to connect to the Jewish people. Our concern in the United States is that the relationship between American Jews and Israel is going through a transition. And what we're working on is strengthening those ties and making sure that American Jews still feel that Israel is their home and that we have a connection to the Jewish people. And that's really been our focus. And of course, you know, one of the biggest focuses, that, and we, we work hand in hand with the reform movement, is to make sure that there is re Jewish religious pluralism in Israel, that that's very important to us and important to many Israelis. So we work together on these issues. Thank you, Sarah. I just want to point out I grew up in a conservative uh, congregation, Temple Hillel of North Woodmere. Uh, the rabbi was Morris Friedman, who was the father of the current ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. I don't know if it's still that name, but it's changed a lot since I lived on Long Island. Uh, but uh, certainly, both from my personal experience and other people's here in the, in the channel, we have focused very much in a way, on these issues that you've talked about. You know, it's very funny. Israelis have a very binary view of religion. You're either dati, religious, or you're secular. It's very hard for them to, like Merkaz, it's very hard for them to find a center ground. And we have really tried to highlight those issues. One example, of course, the struggle to create a prayer space for non-Orthodox, I would even say non-Haredi um, uh, uh, congregations or prayers uh, at the Western Wall, and we have discussed that with 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 many of our leaders. And we have these are issues that we have dis uh, discussed. We've even made news on this. So we had Sipi Hotavelli, who is now heading, who is uh, uh, now uh, going uh, going to going to London. London as the as the ambassador, and we asked her about the issue of religious freedom, and her comment made a lot of. Um, uh, uh, press. I want to ask you, because I have really struggled with how to communicate to Israelis, especially the conservative approach of the fact that it's, you know, it, that, as you said, it, it, it's, it follows the hal it, it tries to uh, innovate along with the halacha and try to discommunicate them about the meaning of conservative Judaism. You've had, I'm sure, those conversations. How do you deal with that, that issue, that challenge? Well, as you say, it is indeed a challenge, but mostly it's a challenge for people who have made up their minds before they talk to us. That if they talk to, we have a school in Jerusalem, the Schechter Institute, and the head of the school, Rabbi David Gulinkin, has spent a lot of time and energy working on halachic issues. And it's a matter of really understanding that halacha continues to evolve and that you have to take modern concerns into account, uh, that we have the right to look at what's going on in the world today and to make decisions based on halakha and what's happening today. So it's a matter of people really opening their minds and not being stuck in where they are. And if you look at, you know, at what we teach and how we teach it and what our rabbis do, you find a diversity. You find different interpretations, but you've mostly what you find is people who really care and who are really committed to Judaism and to the Jewish people and to Israel and to us surviving and being important and vibrant. Thank you, Sarah, for being with us today. Let's move now to Martin Oliner, co-president religious Zionist of America. And uh, I think we have a short clip to watch first.
There is a religious Zionist awakening taking place throughout Israel. You can see it in every sphere of life. In the IDF, more than half of the officers are now wearing kippot, and never before have there been so many religious officers holding the highest ranks of the army. Religious Zionist pioneers saw it as a national imperative to settle the land of Israel, and the results of their motivation, self-sacrifice, and ideology can be felt not only in the settlements of Judea and Samaria, but in Ayarot Pituach development cities all over the periphery of Israel, illuminating and uplifting some of the most challenged in Israeli society. The school system and public service across the country are all being infused and inspired with the spirit of religious Zionism. In the Knesset, there have never been so many knitted kippot in such powerful positions of influence, and the religious Zionist party, the Bayit UD, has transformed itself, opening its doors to Jews of all backgrounds who identify with the values of our movement. This inclusive and powerful message of Torah Eretz Israel is catching on like wildfire across the country. No, he's going to be. So let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we come from and where we are. Um, we believe in Eretz Yisrael, La'am Yisrael, Apitorat Yisrael. It's fundamental, old-fashioned religious Zionism. And for us, there is nothing more important than the land of Israel and the people of Israel and the Torah of Israel. We believe firmly that without the Torah, without a deep commitment to Orthodox Jewry, you cannot have a continuing future Jewish state. Fundamental to us and what we pray for every single day is the return to Jerusalem and the strength of Jerusalem. And that is what we've prayed for for 1,800 years. Zionism became new to religion um, after uh, its, uh, with, the, with the help, most particularly of Rav uh, Avram uh, Yitzchak Her, um, Cook, who was fundamentally focused on the importance of religion and the state, religion and Zionism. He understood and, and, and realized that everything that we do in the state of Israel, the army, the, the very construction of Israel, everything that Herzl stood for had a holy nature. And that's the kind of organization that we continue to be today. We continue to focus on the social needs we have given birth to organizations like Amit, Amuna, Bnei Akiva. These are organizations, as you've seen, that have become more focused in recent years. And we continue a tradition that goes back to the beginnings of Zionism, Herzl, and the beginning of religion. We think both are critical in order to continue and have a, a religious uh, state uh, which is focused on freedom and all of the, and allows for pluralism, but at the same time is focused on the importance of orthodoxy and fundamental uh, principles. Right. Um, Martin, I just want to tell you about an interview that I did two weeks ago. Uh, because of the annexation issue or is, is extending Israeli sovereignty issue, we did a show live from the community of Afrat, in Gush Etzion, just south of Jerusalem. I'm sure you're familiar with it, and many others are. Of course, we had a panel we did with people from differing political views. But of course, we were going out there. I said to my producers, we have to have on the show Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, who is the founding chief rabbi of Efrat, because that community was largely built from his religious Zionist vision. And it's not just a political issue. Of course, you're going to understand the annexation because of their, we cover the differing political views. But I don't think you could really understand that community without hearing someone like Rabbi Riskin explain why he left New York, his, his, his booming congregation, uh, the Lincoln Square Synagogue, moved to Gush Etzion, established that community there, uh, and, uh, and really has built it incredibly over the past 30 years. And he came on the show, um, and we did a 10-minute interview with him. I don't know that I've ever seen him give an extended interview anywhere else in any other media, not on Israeli TV, not on foreign. He doesn't necessarily speak directly to politics, 
but he spoke about some of the themes that you spoke about. And we didn't do that interview necessarily because we're advocating his view or against it, but because you can't understand the story about this community and the decisions it's facing without understanding his vision. So that is, I think, the re that is what I-24 News brings to, uh, again, when you talk about the, the values that you've spoken to, getting that as part of the story and the spotlight that it deserves to have. So, Khaled, um, we're neighbors. Uh, I have the good fortune to have been, been most recently the mayor of the village of Lawrence. Uh, so we're landsmen in the sense that I continue here in Long Island. But Rabbi Riskin is a friend for many years. He is someone who epitomizes what our movement is about. Our movement is about actually going to Israel and doing things. We believe in Hebrew, in Aliyah, and Rav Riskin is probably one of the most important rabbis in the Zionist community, the religious Zionist community today. And it's just an example of the many things that we've done. In, in Jerusalem, we the Pinsker building that I'm sure you're all familiar with, we built that building. Today, we uh, through our schools in Amit and Amuna, uh, B'nai Akiva, we play an active role in every aspect of life in Israel. Um, we are at the forefront of continuing that effort. Uh, we essentially theme here, and they go from here to Israel and from Israel to America. We are, and I, we believe that we have been able to accomplish a dynamic uh, uh, renaissance, uh, and uh, we hope to continue that effort, and we hope that we can continue it uh, through the wonderful uh, channel that you've created uh, to bring uh, to America wonderful things and to bring them from uh, Israel to America and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I want to say amen to your wishes. And uh, I would like now to invite Leah Schwartz, General Director of uh, Habonim Dror, North America. But also, I think we have a short clip to watch first. The fact that this year's workshop got to experience kibbutz life and physical labor, getting up early and being part of a community in that way is truly something special. We give them a lot of emotional support. Um, we really love them a lot. And I think especially in the times of Corona, that relationship has been even more important. And um, helping, giving like helping them feel comfortable and safe. I think that the important thing Thanks a lot for having me and for showing that video. So that, that's just a little clip of how Habanim Drar is uh, really returning to our kibbutz roots and our response to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, our workshop gap year this past year, which is the, the oldest running um, Israel gap year still in existence, entering its 70th year that fall, this coming fall. Um, last year on our gap year, we managed to uh, bring our participants to a Abunim Dror Kibbutz, uh, which had been founded by actually some of the participants' parents. So they were able to go to that kibbutz and spend their time in Israel, uh, not just surviving the coronavirus, but actually really contributing to Israeli society uh, through their physical labor in the agricultural sector. So that's uh, just a pretty stark example of the work that we're doing as Havanim for North America. Um, the movement was established in 1935, and today we're a progressive labor Zionist youth movement, serving Jewish youth across the US and Canada. Through our six overnight summer camps and our 12 year-round activity hubs, as well as our programs in Israel that I've alluded to, we work to build a personal bond and commitment between North American Jewish youth and Israeli society. And our mission is really to educate Jewish youth who, as lifelong leaders and activists, will actualize the Habonim Droy values of social justice, equality, and coexistence in both Israel and North America. So it's uh, obviously a very personal thing for me. I 
grew up in Habonim drawer, um, going to the summer camps. And now at 24 years old, I'm the Maskira Klalit, or the Secretary General of Habonim drawer. So it's um, a very, a very youth-led movement that is really able to bring this progressive labor Zionism to a new generation. All right, Leah. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, when I immigrated to Israel back in 2015, one of my biggest life dreams was to kind of change the narrative that surrounds Israel in the international media, because much of the media that we consume about this country has really nothing to do with the reality on the ground, what humans are experiencing, and being able to provide young people the opportunity to come to this country and really see uh, how people live, uh, the things that they do, you know, where they buy ice cream, the parks that they go to, it really kind of provides a different face to this country than what we are typically exposed to when we turn on the news and watch it. Um, you know, I think that from a global perspective, when I-24 News is trying to cover Israel, we're also looking around at the Israeli organizations that are humanitarian organizations that are the first to be on the ground, uh, because there are so many organizations that are often made up of volunteers by organizations from organizations like yours who come here to do positive things for the world. Um, and that is something that is, you know, innovative about Israel. It is a startup nation um, that provides so many humanitarian organizations uh, to the world. So what I want to ask you is, you know, we're seeing a disparity right now. We're seeing more young Jews feel less connected to the state of Israel around the world. How do you strengthen the relationship? How does your organization strengthen the relationship between Jewish youth in, in the diaspora and the state of Israel, given the negative portrayal that we often see of this country on the media? From my perspective, the most important thing is really giving young people the tools to shape Israel into the type of society we want it to be. Not to say, you know, this is Israeli society, take it or leave it, but rather to say, you know, look at this critically, identify the things that are really admirable, identify the things that really need changing, and you as a young person, I as a young person, can change that. So a big example for us is our introduction of a gender-neutral Hebrew that a few years ago at a, a movement VEDA, or um, organizational decision-making body, uh, the movement decided to start using gender-neutral Hebrew to start saying chavirim ot instead of chavirim. So it was really a way of not just saying, you know, this is the Hebrew language, take it or leave it, but saying, this is the Hebrew language, this is your language, you know, if you want to make it into something that feels more inclusive and more welcoming, it's up to you to change that. Beautiful. All right. Well, Leah, again, we would love to see how uh, we could work together and, and learn more about what your organization does and uh, try to share that with the world. Thank you. Thank you. I think it was very interesting to listen to you all. We just have time to take a, a question. So I got a, a question from uh, Paul. The question is, what is I-24 News stances and views and where on the spectrum, conservative, liberal, moderate, does your content fall? That's the question. Uh, it's the opportunity for me to remind you the DNA of I-24 News. When you are watching news about the Middle East, when you are watching news about Israel, everything is biased. You cannot find an international news except I-24 News unbiased. Why? Because here, what I'm asking to the journalist is not to give their point of view. What I'm asking to the journalist is to deliver the global picture. You can see in this studio, we have a round table. When you watch all the international news channels, the more trendy table that you can have is a triangle or a square. Here, in Jaffa Port, we have a round table. Why? Because around this round table, every night, every morning, every day, in every show, you have the diversity of the Israeli society. You are offering to the viewer the opportunity to do his own opinion. And this is new. This is the reason why of I-24 News. And this is the fight of the journalist of I-24 News to tell the truth, just putting the facts on the table. So Richard, I think it was a, a great moment, I have to say. Indeed it was, uh, Frank. And thank you to you and to Natasha and to Kalev 
and to all involved with uh, the important work of I-24 News. The American Zionist movement and our 33 organizations uh, reach to and represent almost 3 million members of the American Jewish community across the spectrum. One thing we insist upon in our diaspora work is respectful dialogue. If you come to the American Zionist movement, you try to check your ego, you try to check your anger at the door. Come inside, participate, learn, interchange, and exchange. Do so in the spirit of Theodore Herzl, who in 1897 called the disparate Jewish people together in Basel, Switzerland. He did so with a vision. He did so with leadership. And he did so with a passion and a commitment to building a better future for Israel and for the Jewish people. The American Zionist Movement, which is the U.S. Federation of the World Zionist Organization, and which reaches across the United States, committed to moving Zionism forward, has at the center of our work these days not only all 33 organizations, but a special focus on our young people. We know that Zionist youth are our future, and all of us need to work together to build a better future for Israel, for the Jewish people, and for the worldwide global community with which we are in communication. And communication is the key. So we thank I-24 News for spotlighting the American Zionist movement. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I would like to, to thank you for this uh, amazing idea. Personally, and I'm pretty sure it's the same for Natasha and Kalev, mm -hmm. we really enjoyed to be part of this conversation. I hope it's just the first one for a long, a long, long, long series. Um, I, I totally understand what you just said, and we are totally on the same page. Uh, it's very important today, especially today, according to the battle of the media, because everything is a question of perception. And if you are living inside the Middle East, you're optimistic. If you are living outside the Middle East and you are talking about the Middle East, you are pessimistic. And this is the reason why I24 News will continue to have this light of optimism and to connect the reality of Israel and the Middle East to the reality of Europe, to the reality of Africa, and of course, with your help, guys, to the reality of America. So you receive a link today, and I'm inviting you to share this link to make more and more noise about what you are doing and what we are doing in I-24 News. And I hope, unfortunately, we have to stay safe with Corona, and I hope I will be able to travel very soon and to come to visit you personally in America. Leitraot le kulam. Thank you and see you soon.